When J. Frank Wheaton became Minnesota's first black legislator in 1898, he served his term in an aging state house. A new capital was in the works. The building's design was awarded to emerging architect Cass Gilbert, who would go on to create many of America's great edifices. Gilbert's vision was that the structure would be of an Italian Renaissance style and would possess a quiet and dignified character. These traits also describe some notable African Americans at the Capitol, quiet and dignified Renaissance men, whose lives would be intertwined with Minnesota's most important building. Cass Gilbert's plans for the new capital stirred controversy when he demanded to use marble from Georgia. Along with the marble came black workers from Georgia, men like Mason Benjamin Stevens, who knew how to work the stone. The construction of the capital also brought north a prolific stone cutter named Cassaville Bullard. Cassaville told family he had been called to work on the capital. Whether he meant literally or figuratively, the Memphis native with extensive training in stone cutting and brick laying seemed well suited for the project. While laying stone on the Renaissance Revival State House, Cassaville was settling down in St. Paul. He purchased land in the Como Heights edition. Then his wife, whose name was Addison, came up from Memphis and helped him build this house. She held a lamp so there would be light after he came home from work. So he'd work on the house at night. And at the age of 32, she died and left 10 children. They wanted to take us away and put us in a home, but he said, no, I promised my wife I was gonna keep them all together. And he did, yes and I was the youngest. <laughs> it would be cozy times. He made it cozy for us after our mother died. As Bullard put stones into place, his thoughts must have drifted to the future and how the dealings of democracy within these walls would affect his children and grandchildren. Cassaville Bullard's skills and certainly his work on the Capitol made him a highly sought craftsman. From the turn of the century through the post-war period, he had a hand in the construction of some of the best buildings in the Twin Cities. As an African American, Bullard's membership in the local number one bricklayers and stonecutters union was rare and crucial for him getting work. By working on the historic Highland Park water tower, Cassaville Bullard rendered in stone the designs of St. Paul's brilliant black city architect, Clarence Cap Wigington. Like Wigington, Cassaville's work wasn't well known throughout the Twin Cities, but Bullard was noticed by an African-American boy named James Millsap, who watched as the black stone cutter helped build the Ober Boys Club building. Today, bricklayers use tools like brick saws to cut and fit the brick. Not Mr. Bullard. He took a brick hammer and knocked off the corners of the brick and laid them. When he finished, it was impeccable. There were no African-American superintendents or foremen, and he encouraged me to strive for those positions. James Millsap would go on to own and operate a construction company, while Bullard set yet another cornerstone for the future. The stonecutter helped install the Vision of Peace statue and did other work on St. Paul's City Hall, where over a half century later, his grandson, Arlie's son, Jerry Blakey, would serve as one of the few black council members in the city's history. While Cassaville Bullard and other black masons helped lay the capital stone, in over a hundred years, only a few blacks have served in its chambers. Despite this woeful record, African Americans were represented at the capital since the day it opened. For over 50 years, Billy Williams worked as an aide in the governor's reception room to 14 different governors. When he was a boy, Billy was the host at another historic building. He and his brother were pages at an 1880 St. Paul Winter Carnival, where he greeted visitors to a magnificent ice palace near the site where the Capitol would be built. But baseball was Billy's real joy. By the turn of the century, Billy emerged as one of the state's best players. William's charm was as strong as his bat earning him the nickname Gentleman Bill. 
Dear sir, kindly name your lowest terms to play in Toronto during the coming season, and you shall have an immediate reply. Billy caught the eye of a number of scouts. But to play in the best pro leagues, Billy would have to pass himself off as Native American. He did not abandon his race. He said, I'm black, and that's it, and he wouldn't play for them. The year was 1904. Minnesota's new governor, John Johnson, would soon take office in the new capital. Johnson consoled Billy on his tough decision and made him an offer. And he said, uh, I got a job for you as executive aide. You go up there and you set up my office for me. And so that's how he got started there. His official title was messenger and aide, but Billy Williams was often a kind of unelected influence for African Americans at a time when Minnesota's elected officials were as white as the capital's Georgia marble. In 1920, a chill was sent through Minnesota when three black men were lynched in front of a mob of thousands in Duluth. Also in the early 20s, the Ku Klux Klan reared its ugly hooded head in Minnesota. In 1913, a bill was introduced that would ban interracial marriages. Billy, the child of a black father and white mother, offered himself to legislators as proof that there was nothing to fear in an interracial America. The racist bill was defeated, the Klan's public activities were restricted, and anti-lynching laws were passed. In each case, the Capitol's quiet black spokesmen made a real difference on decision makers. During the Depression, the tension and unrest of the nation and the state flowed into the Casota Stone Halls of the Capitol, as Billy noted in his journal. January 28, 1937. Lumberjack strike committee here all day. Governor seems to be equal to the task. April 5, 1937. Several hundred farmers from all parts of the state stormed the Capitol regarding tax matters. February 4, 1937. Many people wait all day to see the governor. Almost impossible to handle the crowds. Billy's work as unofficial ambassador introduced him to a wide range of people, including Minnesota's black movie star, Hilda Sims, and Ethiopian emperor, Halle Selassie. He greeted everyday folks as well as the famous. In fact, he would meet and greet over a quarter of a million people in his half century in the governor's office. Governors come and governors go, but Billy Williams has remained a heritage to citizens of Minnesota and a monument to his race. So much praise from the white community can raise eyebrows in the African American community. One of his criticisms uh, that I noted in the book is that he was considered an Uncle Tom by some people. The historic black paper, the Chicago Defender, gave African Americans across the country a sense of Williams' worth. Billy is six feet of sincere, open-handed friendliness. Governor Olson may run the state, but Billy runs the Capitol. June 28, 1957. Billy Williams closes his desk in the governor's office today for the last time. In 1957, just shy of his 80th birthday, Billy finally retired. The state celebrated the half century of service of Minnesota's assistant governor. For a historic retirement gift, Billy was honored as only Minnesota governors are when they leave the capital. He had his portrait painted. Theodore Soner, who painted portraits of governors Youngdahl and Ty, rendered Billy on canvas. Billy Williams, who never married, lived with his niece. At her home in 1963, Billy passed away. For decades, Billy's portrait, his well-worn desk, and much of his story collected dust in storage. Also chipped away from Minnesota's memory was stonecutter Cassaville Bullard. How many knew of the black hands that helped shape the Capitol and other buildings? In the mid-90s, Cassaville's youngest daughter decided to right this wrong. She campaigned to have the family house and Bullard's story added to the National Register of Historic Places. The capital's famous focal point, the Quadriga, represents the progress of the state. Less familiar icons like Williams and Bullard are also great symbols of progress. Bullard's daughter says her father helped set the gilded statue in place. She proudly shares these stories from the Galtier home, just blocks from the Capitol, where her amazing father's work is always within view. <laughs>